If you would turn with me in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Continuing in 1 Corinthians. Picking up this week with verse 12. The apostle teaching the church under inspiration of God says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overcome you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. It's impossible for us who are church people, Christians, it's impossible for us in this Passover season, this spring Passover season, to not reflect on the Lord Jesus' crucifixion and on the week leading up to it. On this Sunday that tradition marks as the Sunday of triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as the beginning of that week, we reflect on what that was, what was declared, who he was, who the people saw him as, and what that all meant. And every year when we reflect on this, I tell you every time that the triumph that Christ was presenting to them, the triumph over sin, over death, and over hell, by faith in what he would accomplish by becoming sin for them, that triumph was not the triumph that the crowd was excited about. I tell you that every year. What they were excited about was essentially a false Christ, a false Messiah, an idolatrous Christ. Even as they cried out, Hosanna, save now, they were crying out for temporary, political, military salvation from the Romans. They were crying out for a general on a white horse when their king sat before them on a donkey, an animal of peace and lowliness. Take heed lest you fall into the same trap. Be careful lest your Christ is different from the Christ of the gospel. Be careful lest your Christ is different than the Christ of Scripture. Be careful lest you fall in with the masses. Don't fall in with the crowd. Don't fall in with popular thinking. Don't fall in with pure tradition. Don't fall in with emotional fancies. Don't fall in with what you think serves you best to build you up. Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation, for the flesh is weak, and the false Christs are very tempting, because the false Christs are made in our image. Instead, we are to be molded into the image of Christ. Now, this passage here about temptation is probably on the surface one of those passages that actually discourages more than encourages. I know that in, in the past when I used to read this, and it says that you won't be tempted beyond what you could bear, I think, am I doing something wrong? Because most of the time when we're tempted, we feel that it's more than we can bear. But it's not as discouraging as you think. We have to take this in its full perspective. And we have to recognize that there is grace, and there is triumph of God, and there is power of God, and there is gospel, 
And there is salvation even here. We remember that when we take this passage and see it as God means it to be seen, we weigh ourselves against him. We are not salvation. I am not salvation. You are not salvation. God is salvation. And God alone is salvation. What we are also supposed to take away from this and be very clear about is that as God is salvation, he is not behind our sin. Where, where this passage is encouraging is in first and foremost reminding us in, in, in verse 13 that our temptation is not unique. Our temptation is not unheard of. He comes right out and says, no temptation has overtaken you except as is common to men. You are not alone in your struggles. Just knowing that is actually encouraging. Because when you feel that you're alone, when you feel that you alone have the target on your back, when you think that nobody's going through what you're going through, that can be overwhelmingly oppressive. But God himself comes right out and says, there is no temptation that you are enduring that somebody else you know hasn't either experienced or is experiencing right now. Don't ever think that you are the only one. It's very easy to sit in church and to look around and to think that everybody else has it all put together. That's absolutely wrong. I'm telling you right now that each and every one of us are shipwrecks. shipwrecks. Each and every one of us have the waves smashing us against the rocks continuously. Each and every one of us are broken goods. And if you're sitting here right now and thinking, well, not me, then you really don't understand the gospel. For we all fall short of the glory of God. No one is righteous, not even one, for all have sinned. No one does good. No one seeks after God. All of our hearts are desperately wicked. And there is no temptation that someone else, very likely in this room, has not experienced just the same as you. How do we deal with that? The self-deception comes when we hunger for perfection. When we hunger for perfection, then we can become overwhelmed because sometimes we want God's attributes, but we don't want God himself. Sometimes we want the perfection that we see of God, but we want what surrounds him, not him. Sometimes we seek his law, we seek his morals, we seek his way, but we don't seek him first. And that's how we get into the mess. That's how we fall into the trap of failing and then thinking, what have I done wrong? What have I done to deserve this? Does God love me? Is God with me? Why am I falling into this over and over again? Why am I so weak? Why can't I be strong? Well, we have to understand our temptations in the context of the curse. We have to always remember that the curse touches everything. There will not be total perfection here on earth under the sun. Not until God comes back. Not until we're in glory with him. For the curse is going to touch everything. On your best day, you're going to make a mistake. On your best day, you're going to mess up something. The greatest piece of artwork, the greatest piece of science is going to have some flaw in it that, might, that won't be, may not be discovered right away, but will be discovered eventually. Everything that human being beings touch is under the curse. That's what sin has done to this earth. And to seek perfection without seeking God himself is foolish and is, in a way, seeking a false god. Everything is marked by sin. And so when we grasp that our temptation is not unique, we think of the curse and we recognize that it's all marked by sin. And the way we cope and the way we deal 
is to rest in God and to increase our faith in His ability, in His power, in His might, in His salvation, not in our efforts, not in our works, not in our display. This passage is encouraging in that it reminds us of that, and it's encouraging in that it reminds us of the ability that we actually are targeted. There is temptation that targets us because of the curse. In addition to a knowledge of the curse, the Scripture tells us that we are to know that the deceiver, our adversary, that old serpent, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And if you are a Christian, if you are born again, you need to remember and know that he has absolutely no power over you whatsoever. But he sees you as a moving target. And he is constantly going to throw fiery darts at you. And very often those darts may look good to your eyes. They may very well be in line with what you favor, with what you like, with what you enjoy, with what you are enticed with. He knows that, and he targets those affections. But this is why we are not to be an impulsive people. Because the flashy, shiny temptation that goes before us, if we just grab it by impulse, without discernment, without prayer, without reflection, we may very well be falling into the trap of the adversary. This is why we are not to be an intoxicated people. This is why we're always supposed to have our wits about us. We're not supposed to be led astray. We're not supposed to be uh, not in control of our faculties because we want to be able to make proper decisions. We don't want to be deceived by false Christs, by false gods, by false virtues, by false pleasures. We are to be sober. We are to be vigilant. We are to be discerning. And we're also supposed to know ourselves and our own weaknesses. When this passage tells us that no temptation has come to us except that is common to everybody, we need to know those temptations so that we can recognize them first. When we know these things, we're also to bring our gaze back to God himself. We must keep our purpose in mind as we move forward and wade through life, wade through the curse, wade through a fallen world. There's a big difference between a trip or a drive that you go on for its own sake and a drive that you go on with a goal in mind or with, an est with a time of arrival or with a deadline that needs to be met. When you have a goal in mind, the stops along the way are not as appealing. They're not as enticing. And when you see the billboard that says this attraction is on the exit, it's out of the question. See, the temptations are always there. But if you keep your one true purpose in mind, those temptations become billboards that you have no time for. Because you're on the road to Christ. And you want to get to him as quickly and as possibly, as quickly and as easily as possible. It's where your goal is, where your heart is, where your affection is, where your future is that keeps you on this right path. And in our discernment, we ask the question of ourselves, will this aid in my faith? Will this draw me closer to my Lord? Will this advance God's kingdom? Does this glorify the first love of my life. No temptation has come to you except that which is common to all. But if we recognize those temptations, we can more easily find them less tempting. 
So you're not alone in your struggles. You're not alone in your weakness. But you're also not alone when it comes to help and rescue. This passage is meant as an encouragement where it says God is faithful. God's not neglectful. God's not abusive. God is faithful. Right there, we're to take note, stand up. God is faithful in that God is your only source of salvation and that he really is the God of everything. That he's aware and that he's powerful enough to aid you and keep you in every challenge and in every hardship. God is faithful. God is good. God is just. God is righteous. And the scripture tells us that God is not the author of sin. If anything comes out of this passage, we are to walk away with remembering that we are not tempted by God and that our sin does not come from him. God is not behind your temptation. He has nothing to do with sin. He has providence over it, but he is separate from it. He does not create it. I've told you before what, what he does when sin abounds is he merely just takes his hands away. When he puts his hands on a situation, it diminishes. When he takes his hands away, a heart is hardened. But he is totally separate from that sin. This is important because we need to know that running to God is always the best course when we're in hardship, when we're despairing, when we feel at a loss, when we feel overwhelmed. I've said before, I'm, I always marvel and question the person who runs away from God when things are bad. The only place you can run for good is God. And so run to him. He's faithful. He's not the author of sin. He's not the source of evil. Never run away. You need more Bible. You need more prayer. You need more preaching. You need more fellowship. You need more of church, not less. When you feel your faith waning or weakening, when you look in the world and you see things not the way you wish they were, more of God, not less. Because he is not behind the evil. He is not behind your faltering. This passage needs us to know that we cannot blame God or others for our sin. Blame is a deadly and dangerous game. Blame accomplishes nothing but to cultivate more pride and more hardness of heart. And right from the beginning of sin, the blame game is played. Adam says, the woman. The woman says, the serpent. Not me. It wasn't my fault. No, that's not true. The scripture says you sinned, you acted, you fell. The temptation was not the sin, but you yielded to that and you sinned. God is saying that Adam had the choice in the matter and he, choose to, he chose to ignore God. The reality, according to this passage, is that when we are aware of our situation, when we consciously choose sin, we know very well that we've made that choice. When we look at something that's tempting, when we hear something that's tempting, when we follow something that's tempting, and then we cross the line into sin, we've done it. We're not talking about non-willful or accidental sin. That's sinful too. But this is talking about your conscious understanding of temptation and sin. 
People like to talk about the free will of humanity. Well, I don't like the sovereignty of God because it means I don't have free will. You have all the free will in the world when it comes to your own sin. All your sin is of your free will. All that is good and all that is righteous is of God's will and God's power. And you sinned of your own free will. And so we can't blame others for that. Instead, we are to look at others and say, there but for the grace of God go I. We can't look at others as being less or weaker than we are. We can't look at others and say, what's their problem? Aren't they, why can't they be strong like me? I'm better than you. Then you're just like the Pharisee. Thank you, Lord, that you made me to be not like this tax collector. Instead, like the tax collector, our response is, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and nothing else. We're not allowed to despise. We're not allowed to reject. We're not allowed to say, this person did it. We're only allowed to repent. There's no excuse. And we have nobody to blame but ourselves. And when we hit that realization, and when we come to that clarity of truth, we are told in this passage that God provides the way of escape. There is one way out. Christ. God himself is your only escape. There is no amount of penance that will make things right. There is no amount of works righteousness that will make things right for you. There is no amount of apology in verbal form that will smooth things over between you and God. There is no amount of counted pagan-like prayers that will make things right for you. There is no achievement that will really get you out of your jam of sin and temptation. Only God. Only redemption from the outside. Only the one who himself is perfect can take your imperfection and say, I will carry you. I will be your God. You will be one in me. This can only be done by the Redeemer. He alone is your escape. And he alone is your way out. And God is everywhere. God is all powerful. So when he says he always provides you a way of escape, we look at that very cynically on the surface and we go, that's not my experience. But there was never a time in your life that God was not one call away. Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Call unto me. Come unto me, and you will find rest for your soul. There is never a point in your life where God is too distant to hear you. And so there is always the way of escape in him. He's always here. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And as great as temptation might be, he's greater. He is your rescue. He is your salvation. He is the beginning and the end of your faith. Call unto him, go unto him, live unto him. And this is why the apostle in the next verse says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry, knowing these things, knowing your sin, being watchful, knowing his power, knowing that he, he can overcome the curse, him alone. You know these things. It's by his power, by his grace. Flee from idolatry. Remember, it's therefore my beloved, not therefore my tolerated, not therefore my acquaintances, 
Not therefore my kind of sort of friends, but therefore my beloved, the people I have died for, the people I have greatest affection for. Therefore, my beloved, and yes, it's Paul speaking in the context, but he is beloving them in Christ, just as Christ is our beloved. He is, we are his beloved. Flee from idolatry because of love. Flee from self-worship. Flee from worshiping other people. Flee from worshiping places. Flee from worshiping things. Flee from the false Christs made in your image. Recognize sin in all of its raw and real ugliness and flee from it. If we believe that sin is really what the Bible says it is, something that is absolutely separate from God, something that is absolutely deadly, something that causes death, something that poisons, something that kills, something that destroys. If we really believe that that's sin, we will not find it enticing if God, by His grace, can take the blinders from our eyes so that we can actually see what it is. A pile of rotting, stinking garbage is not attractive and should not be attractive. Raw sewage should not be appetizing and should never be appetizing. We need to see the reality, not the deception. And that will keep us away from evil. And that will keep us from willfully sinning. You know very well, we say it all the time, Scripture says it, what you love most is your God. And what you love most, you will worship. Think back to that scene in Jerusalem at the beginning of Passover week on that day. Think back again to the cries of save now. Were they asking Christ to save their souls? Were they crying cries of repentance? Lord, be merciful to us sinners. We are unworthy of you. Were they basking in the glory and wonder and splendor of his grace? That is, the favor that they did not earn or deserve on any level? Were they crying cries of absolute love and affection for God with us, Emmanuel, here on earth? No. Their cry of save now was a cry of power and a cry of control. Their cry was, destroy those Romans. Get this evil out of the way so we can actually be God's nation again. They were saying, take the enemies away. Destroy the enemies. Save now. Beware, American Christian, that your cry for salvation is not also the cry for a military Christ. Beware your craving of power and control on earth now. Beware what you want from God and ask yourself if it really is spiritual, if it really is of the heart, and if it really is for you to get right with him first. Be the witness that he's called you to be. The witness of what? The witness of his death, of his resurrection, and his triumph over all his enemies. He's got them in hand. He's victorious. Are you witness to his accomplished victory? Or are you trying to fight right alongside him? Are you willing to be the martyr with the suffering servant riding on the donkey? Or are you just craving the great white horse? Are you out to love God and love your neighbor as yourself? Or are you out for rule keeping? See, when you're born again and you've died to self, you now have the deepest fellowship with your Lord. 
There's no reason to be insecure about anything you see on planet Earth. No reason to be insecure. Because there's no defeat. Christ has already triumphed. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. There's no defeat. He's won. And we can say that I know that my Redeemer lives. And I know that I am redeemed from sin, from death, from hell. I know that great victory. And I know that the log that was in my eye was way bigger than the speck that's in that person's eye. And I have no idea why God would want to do that for me, but he has. And so I will testify to that. I will go to the right source. I will go to the right God. I will say no to temptation. And I will say yes to trust, to faith, to belief. I will say no to works and achievement and self-righteousness. And I will say yes to grace. The verse at the top of your outline, which comes from Isaiah 41. The Lord captures this in a nutshell. For I, the Lord your God, I... The Lord God will hold your right hand, your arm of strength. I'll take your strength. I'll take your fighting hand. And I'll hold it. I'll do it. And I'll say to you, fear not. In hurricanes, fear not. In global warming, fear not. In pandemics, fear not. In elections, fear not. In False messages, fear not. Fear not. I will help you. I own all those things. I own all those people. I will help you. Fear not. I'll remind you who you are without me. You worm. Jacob. Fear not. I've taken you from being a worm, and I've made you men of Israel. Men who reign and rule with God. I will help you. I am help itself. I am the Lord. And I am your Redeemer. The Holy One. The only Holy One. The only truth. The only way. The only righteousness. Fear not. And trust Him. Your Redeemer lives the only God of salvation. Let's pray. Lord, may we embrace the King of Kings on the donkey. May we live in him. May we live with him. May we live to him. May we walk as he walked. May we speak as he spoke. May we love as he loved. May we be totally buried and dead in, in dead. And may we have risen again with him to new life. Take away our fears. Take away our insecurities. Show us where our heart is. Help us to discern temptation and flee it. And help us to serve the one true Christ, the one true Savior, the one true anointed, in love forever and ever. For we pray this and ask this great application by your power, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.